Oh, thank you very much for the uh, lovely introduction, Andy. Uh, fellow Toastmasters and very welcome guests. So, habit. I'm going to start off with a quote, which some of you may have heard before. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. I, I can see a few faces that uh, you might be familiar with that. Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, lived, he was a few years ago, well, when I say a few years ago, like, you know, a few hundred thousand sort of years ago. Anyway, and that relates to what we do every day. We are our habits. And actually, there was a 2006 study from Duke University, and there's been studies since that shown that 40% of our day-to-day -day behaviour is habit. We don't, or unconsciously, we're not thinking about what we're doing. So that's an awful lot of what we're doing without thinking about it. So what I'm going to cover tonight is how habits are formed, a little bit around the neuroscience on it, how long it takes to make a habit and how habits are formed, and then a little bit about how you might break a habit. So the best definition I've got of a habit was from the University of Cambridge Dictionary, and it is something that you do so regularly without thinking about, as I just demonstrated that it becomes unconscious behaviour. So how's it formed? So there's different parts of your brain and there's one part called the prefrontal cortex and that really processes information as it comes in. So when you're learning a new behaviour, it has to use it at all. Your brain will be very, very active in that part of the brain trying to process new information and that's why you shouldn't try and learn too much at once but when a behavior is done so regularly it then is processed and done over and over again in the part of the brain called the basal ganglia and when a behavior is done over and over again what is formed are neural pathways in the brain now a neural pathway allows the trans transferring of neurons across the brain electric signals transferring bits of information so as we've got more neural pathways, we're able to do habits over and over again because we've got more. There's a great book I want to cover called The Power of Habit by an author called Charles Darhig. And he came up, he talks about even the habit loop and that's devised the three things. And those three things are to make a habit, you've got a cue, a routine and a reward. So the cue is something that triggers the behaviour. So let's use the example of walking into a room. You walk into a dark room and the cue is, oh, it's dark. The routine is press the light switch and then the reward is you get light. So that's a very, very simple example there. But we do that unconsciously. We don't even think about it. And it's just like walking down the street. Now, how long does it take to form a habit is my next bit. So you've probably heard many debates, many studies, 21 days, 30 days to form a habit, 60 days to form a habit. Some new studies are saying 66 days, 100 days to form a habit, longer. But there's an expert called James Clear, and it's a shame Anita's not on tonight because she introduced me to his work, who's he's recently written a book called Atomic Habits. And unfortunately, I can't seem to order it, which is annoying, but it's got an audio version that you can. And his view, and I very much agree with, is that a habit, stop because, uh, you stop having a habit when you stop doing the behaviour, in that a habit will take as long as it takes to form. So studies from James Clear, when he was looking at studies, shown that eating healthy, some people develop that habit in three weeks. But people trying to do regular intense exercise, it took them two, three months to do. And again, it varied on the individual from individual to individual. So there's two things that James Clear came up with in terms of forming a habit and many more, but these were the main two, is that to form a habit, it's got to be easy. Try and make it as simple as possible. So he had a client who really didn't like going to the gym. And there's probably lots of people who really don't like going to the gym. Uh, sorry to see a couple of people nodding. Uh, no, we've all got different tastes. But this client really didn't like going to the gym. And all he did, all James Clear told his client to do was go to the gym for five minutes. Just turn up, get changed, walk around, go home. That sounds a bit pointless, doesn't it? Going to the gym and going home. But he was then able to build on that habit. 
he was able to develop more of a longer routine by the simple act of turning up, by making it easy. That's why you get advice like five minutes of meditation to start off with before you get into 20 minutes meditation. The other part of forming a habit is reward. So there's a chemical called dopamine that's produced a feel-good chemical in the body when we get a reward. So studies have also shown that when we associate a reward with a new behaviour, we're more likely to do it because when we're getting that extra reward, it's telling our brain, this is good, we need to do more of that. So for example, as long as you're not obviously doing an exercise thing, having a bit of chocolate, because if you're doing a good bit of exercise and add chocolate, that might be a bit counterproductive, but reward yourself with something else. But if you reward yourself with chocolate for meditating, that's telling your brain, we're getting this reward this is good. And study a study was done by Charles Darhig in Mexico, and it associated that people even do behaviours before they get the reward. They see the craving as an act of doing the behaviour. Now, just removing a habit, now this can be a bit more challenging, in that you, you heard of things like alcohol addiction, drug addiction, smoking is difficult to give up, um, and actually an even more common one, social media addiction, we're glued to our phones all the time. And the problem is, as I talked about the neural pathways before from neuroscience studies, is that when a neural pathway is formed, it does not disappear. You can only weaken it. So a couple of ways to reduce it. First of all, you can alter the loop. So you can get rid of the queue. So you can turn off your phone so you don't have that queue to check your text messages. Or you can alter the routine, but you always crave the reward. So you need to either change the cue or the routine. So if you're bored and you go for something to eat, you could change your unhealthy snack, Charles Darhig thought as well, with a more healthy snack, like an apple. So as I'm sort of wrapping up today, there's a couple of bits of actionable advice I wanted to give from this, from these studies and how I've applied into my own life. Your habits make you, as I referenced at the start, we are what we repeatedly do and quite a lot of our behaviour is unconscious. But consciously recognising what habits you want to form and then thinking how you can make them as easy as possible and how you can associate reward with them is one great way, is one good thing to do. But then think about the things you want to give up. Think about how you're going to, if you want to give up drinking, if you want to give up smoking, think about how you can reduce those behaviours. And then consciously do it and don't try and do too many at the same time because like I talked about, the prefrontal cortex can only process so much information. That's a kind of processing thing. But once a habit's done, then, then go on to a new habit and then change them or make them. So I could talk about habit for ages because I love it so much, but that's my whistle stop tour of habits. I hope I've given good value to everyone tonight and thank you very much for listening.